everyone, today we are going to be learning about chapter 10, transport system in humans and animals. Let's go! Now all living things require essential substances and need to expel cellular waste products. Example of essential substances or products are oxygen and nutrients. An example of cellular waste products are carbon dioxide and nitrogenous wastes. Both unicellular and multicellular organisms have both different ways to obtain and expel those substances. Unicellular organisms use simple diffusion to obtain their essential substances and expel wastes to the external environment. How so is because unicellular organisms have a small body mass and a large total surface area per volume ratio, so they do not require specialized transport systems. Multicellular organisms, on the other hand, can't conduct the substance exchange in and out of the cell via simple diffusion. That's because multicellular organisms have a large body mass, small total surface area per volume ratio, and the distance between the external environment and the cell is too far for direct exchange. So, to address this problem, multicellular organisms are already blessed with a specialized transport system. And it is the blood circulatory system. Now, there are two types of blood circulatory system, namely the open circulatory system and the closed circulatory system. Now, let's watch a video of me explaining on these systems. Okay, guys, so here it is. I, I drew something. I hope you really understand. So, let us see the drawings for both open circulatory system and closed. Let us see open first. As you can see, this is the hemolymph over here. As I said before, hemolymph is the blood-like nutritious fluid that is only found in insects and um, mollusks. So this is the vessel where the hemolymph flows, direct flow to the open-ended vessel. I, you see, I could already written it here. It's an open-ended vessel. So these are the, this is the body cavity. Yeah, this is the body cavity and the uh, cells in it. So the hemolymph will actually bath the cells in the body cavity okay that's the heart and uh, yeah so moving on to the closed circulatory system it's the same this is called the hemolymph vessel but this is called the blood vessel i'm sure you have no you have heard more about that blood vessel in our human body so blood flows this is the heart as per normal blood flows not hemolymph but blood blood flows into a closed type of um it isn't as open as this one as you can see it's closed and if you can see these are cells um, if you can, I hope you can picture where you've learned this in form three, where cells, uh, cells that are oxygenated cells, oxygenated blood actually that contains oxygen and some nutrients would actually um, diffuse out and into the body body cells. So it is like the same theory, and yeah, you see, you, as you can see, it's there are some cells inside here and there are some cells outside. Just picture that. So I, I guess that's about it for um, the first part of the blood circulatory system. I hope you guys understand on what I've actually explained earlier. So thank you all for watching. Well, I hope my explanation helped you to understand better. Now open circulatory systems can be found in insects. This means that one or two hearts pump hemolymph through the blood vessels into the hemosole. However, closed circulatory systems can be found in fish, amphibians, and humans. Now let's look at the closed circulatory system in fish. The heart of a fish has two chambers, one atrium and one ventricle. This means blood flows in one direction only. This is why the fish circulatory system is known as the single circulatory system. Now closed circulatory system in amphibians, the heart of an amphibian has three chambers which are two atrium and one ventricle. They have two blood circulatory systems, namely the pulmocutaneous and the systemic system. Both oxygenated blood and deoxygenated blood will mix in the ventricle. Now this is why this system is known as the double circulatory system. Now let's look at the closed circulatory system in humans. The human heart has four chambers, namely two atria and two ventricles. Blood flows through the heart twice. Oxygenated blood and deoxygenated blood don't mix. 
This is why the system is known as the double complete circulatory system. Now let's look at the similarities between blood circulatory systems in complex multicellular organisms. They are, the system is found in all multicellular organisms. System consists of a heart to pump blood or hemolymph. System functions to transport nutrients and wastes. And the heart has valves to ensure blood flows in one direction. Take note, yeah? Now let's look at the differences between circulatory systems in complex multicellular organisms. Feel free to pause to identify the difference. These are mighty important. Hope the video was really helpful. Stay blessed and stay safe. Video prepared by Sadisha Manimaran for Science. Hello everyone, let's move into subtopic 10.2 right now. Let's go! Alright, so there are three main components in the human circulatory system and they are blood, heart and the blood vessels. So blood is a type of connective tissue that is made up of blood plasma, blood cells and platelets. Blood acts as a medium of transportation. Heart functions as a muscular pump that circulates blood to the whole body. And now blood vessels on the other hand consists of arteries, capillaries and veins that are connected to the heart and transport blood to all blood body tissues. Now let's watch a video of me explaining about the structure of the human heart. Alright so I kind of draw something, I, it kind of looks complicated but you know what? Trust me, okay? Uh, hear me out. I hope. I, I'll make this into a story. So, let us just begin. But before we begin, I'm going to explain. I'm going to tell you that the blue ones are for deoxygenated blood and the red ones are for oxygenated blood. So, let us make this into a story. A simple story for you guys to understand and remember. It starts from the lungs over here. So, how exactly is when you inhale oxygen, you we inhale oxygen, right? So, oxygen will enter our lungs and specifically into the alveolus and the oxygen from the alveolus will diffuse into the um, blood capillaries and there will be blood there so it will um, the blood will become oxygenated blood also known as hemoglobin oxyhemoglobin so the oxyhemoglobin from the lungs will flow into the pulmonary veins so it will enter the pulmonary vein which is the beginning part, part of the heart where it enters it enters and then it goes into the left atrium and into the left ventricle and it will go up and as, I, as you can see I put two dots here these two are semilunar valves okay so um, it will enter and or, we should know that this is the aorta it is the biggest artery in the heart so it, it um, why is it big is because it should withstand the pressure of the oxy oxygenated blood so the oxygenated blood will then flow to all parts of the body. So yeah, so the blood will be going to all parts of the body. When it reaches the body cells, the body cells will take the oxygenated blood, you know, take just take the oxygen and it will release carbon dioxide. So it will release carbon dioxide into the blood and the blood will become deoxygenated blood. So the deoxygenated blood will then flow into the vena cava right here. So yeah, as you can see, deoxygenated blood from the body cells. So it will enter the vena cava, enter the right atrium, enter, go through the tricuspid valve and into the right ventricle. And then it will go through the pulmonary artery and to the lungs again to fetch some more oxygen. So I guess that's about it for now. Um, I'm pretty sure you guys know how it labels, like where's the septum, where's the ventricles, the tricuspid valves. And so, so I really hope this video helps you to understand better and I hope in some way it will help you during the exams. So, thank you for listening. I really hope my explanation helped you to understand better. Now, take a closer look on the composition of human blood. Pause the note down. There are three types of blood cells in our body namely the erythrocyte known as the red blood cell, platelets and leukocyte known as the white blood cell. 
Now, let us look at the characteristics of erythrocyte first. It has an elastic plasma membrane. The biconcave disc shape enables a large total surface area per volume ratio for efficient gas exchange produced in bone marrow of bones such as sternum and ribs. Its functions, on the other hand, is that it has a hemoglobin which is the red pigment that makes blood look red and oxyhemoglobin releases oxygen in tissues or cells when partial pressure of oxygen is low. Now let's look into platelets. Platelets are produced from fragments or scraps of cell cytoplasm that originate from the bone marrows. The lifespan is less than one week and it functions in blood clotting process. Now let's move into the third one, which is leukocyte, which is also known as white blood cell. Leukocyte is divided into two, which is granulocytes and agranulocytes. Its characteristics are, shape is irregular and is not fixed, contains nucleus and does not contain hemoglobin. Its functions on the other hand is to diffuse out of the capillary, pore and fight pathogens in tissue fluids. Now, let us know detailly about the first type of leukocyte, which is the granulocytes. Granulocytes are divided into two, three, which are neutrophil, eosinophil, and basophil. For neutrophil, the nucleus is made up of two to five lobes, ingests bacterial cells and dead cells from wounds by phagocytosis. For eosinophil, the nucleus is made up of two lobes, releases enzymes that fight inflammation and allergy reactions. And for basophil, the number of basophils is the lowest in the blood and it contains heparin that prevents blood clotting. Now for the second type of leukocyte which is the agranulocytes, it is divided into two which is the lymphocyte and the monocyte. Lymphocyte contains a large nucleus with very little cytoplasm. It produces antibodies to destroy bacteria and viruses that enter the body. And for monocyte, it is the biggest leukocyte. It ingests bacteria and dead cells by phagocytosis. These are human blood vessels. Now the human vessels are divided into three which are the arteries, capillaries and veins. Now arteries are blood vessels that transport blood out of the heart. The function of the artery is to quickly transport blood at a high pressure to the tissues. Now this is what an artery looks like. Take a closer look. Now let's look into the second type of human blood vessel which is the blood capillaries. Capillaries are blood vessels with thin walls as thick as one cell. Blood capillaries allow the exchange of gases to occur between blood and cells through the simple diffusion. Nutrients, excretory substances and hormones diffuse through the blood capillaries. Now this is how a blood capillary looks like from arteries to the vein. Now the third type of human blood vessel is the veins. Capillaries rejoin to form larger blood vessels called venules. The venules combine to form veins that transport blood back to the heart. Now this is what a vein looks like. Take a closer look. Now let's look at the differences between these two human blood vessels. Some of the main differences between the artery and the veins are epithelial tissue, smooth muscles, connective tissues, valve and the capillaries within it. Here is important information that might be helpful. These are the differences between the human blood vessels that I've mentioned earlier. These are in more detail. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope the video really helped. Stay safe and stay blessed. Video prepared by Sadisha Manimaran, Class 4 Science. Hello everyone, let's move into subtopic 10.3 and 10.4. Let's go! Now the heart is made up of cardiac muscles that intersect and are connected with one another. 
This arrangement allows electric impulses to spread rapidly through the heart and stimulates the cardiac muscle cells to contract simultaneously and uniformly. Now let's move into the blood circulation in humans. Look at the picture. The produced force that enables blood to circulate in humans is generated by the pumping of the heart and the contraction of the skeletal muscles. Now for the pumping of the heart. The contraction of the heart is initiated and coordinated by a pacemaker. The pacemaker, located at the right atrium ball, is a group of specific heart muscle cells that initiates the rate of heart contraction. The pacemaker generates electrical impulses that spread rapidly through both walls of atrium and causes the atrium to contract rhythmically. Now, moving on into the heart muscle contraction sequence. The main pacemaker is called the sinoatrial node. The sinoatrial node, also known as SA, generates electrical impulses. Now the electrical impulses spread rapidly in both the atria, causing the atria to contract simultaneously. The contraction of the atria helps to pump blood to the ventricles. The electrical impulses reach the arteriovenricular node, which is known as AVN. The electrical impulses spread through the bundle of his and the Purkin J fibers up to the apex of the heart. The electrical impulses spread from the apex of the heart to the whole ventricle wall. As a result, the ventricles contract to pump blood out to the lungs and the body. Now, let's watch a short video that can help us visualize the pumping of the heart. Well, I really hope you found that video useful. During heart pumping, the lub dub sound can be heard. The sound is the closing sound of the heart valves. The first lub sound is produced when the tricuspid valve and the bicuspid valve closes. The second dub sound is produced when the semilunar valve closes. Now, let's look into the mechanism of blood clotting. Why is blood clotting necessary? When one has injured his finger and is bleeding, the blood clotting process will stop the blood. Blood clotting will stop or minimize the loss of blood on the injured vessel. Blood clotting also prevents bacteria from entering the blood stream through the damaged vessel. Now, let's study the mechanism of blood clotting. Blood clotting involves a series of chemical reactions that takes place in the blood when someone is injured to prevent excessive bleeding. It all starts from the prothrombin, an inactive plasma protein. The coagulated platelets, damaged cells and clotting factors in the blood plasma will form an activator known as a thrombokinase. Thrombokinase with the aid of calcium ions and vitamin K converts prothrombin to thrombin. There it is, thrombin, an active plasma protein that acts as an enzyme. Thrombin catalyzes the conversion of fibrinogen to fibrin. And there it is, fibrin, but a soluble version. From fibrin soluble, turns into a fibrin, but insoluble version. The insoluble version of a fibrin is a thread-like protein that forms a network on the wound surface to trap erythrocytes and to close the wound to prevent blood loss. 
Now I totally understand if that was really hard and complicated. Let's watch this video for a better understanding. Even under physiological conditions, a small tear can appear in the wall of a blood vessel. In order to prevent blood loss, platelets and coagulation factors such as the pivotal factor 10, acting in a coordinated manner, close this wound. The platelets are responsible for a first sealing of the tear. Then, a number of coagulation factors are activated leading to the formation of fibrin strands which stabilize the growing clot. These processes can also be triggered inappropriately and play a major role in the pathology of ACS, VTE and AF. Thromboembolic disorders can affect both types of blood vessels. Arterial or white clots are primarily triggered by the rupture of an atherosclerotic plaque. Arterial clots are platelet rich. Venous or red clots on the other hand mainly consist of red blood cells and fibrin. Vascular injury, hypercoagulability of the blood and venous stasis play a crucial role in their development. It is important to note that the formation of both types of clots, arterial and venous, always involves platelets as well as coagulation factors. Finally, let's look at the health issues related to blood clotting. Under normal conditions, blood does not clot in blood vessels that are not damaged because of some anticoagulants such as heparin. But when the blood clotting mechanism of an individual does not function, these three are most likely to happen, haemophilia, thrombosis, and embolism. Haemophilia is an example of illness that prevents blood from clotting. Thrombosis is a formation of blood clot. Thrombosis happens as a result of damage in the blood vessels. Embolism, on the other hand, is when blood clot is transported by blood flow. The blood clot is called embolus. If the embolus gets stuck in the tiny blood vessel, the blood flow will stop. Alright, thank you all for watching. Hope this video and my previous videos were helpful. Stay blessed and stay safe. Video prepared by Sadisha Manimaran, Class 4 Science. Movement and locomotion in animals, fish. Like human, fish also have an antagonistic muscles. It is called myotome. The fish vertebral column is flexible and can be moved from side to side by the contraction and relaxation of myotome. The myotome is the W-shaped muscle segments. These antagonistic muscles act in opposite directions. As the myotome on the right contracts, the one on the left relaxes. As a result, the tail is weak to the left. The action causes parts of the body to move from side to side, pushing water backwards and sideways, and hence moving the fish forward. Birds Locomotion Bird has a large and strong antagonistic muscle that is called sternum. A sternum on a bird's chest assists in the flapping of the wings. When the pectoralis major contracts and the pectoralis minor relax, the wings are pulled down. And when the pectoralis minor contracts, the pectoralis major relax. Therefore, the wings are pulled up. Locomotion of the earthworm The circular and longitudinal muscles contract and relax rhythmically to produce peristaltic waves along the body which allow the earthworm to move forward. 
The posterior longitudinal muscle complex and the circular muscle relax. The earthworm becomes shorter and thicker. The kitty at the posterior segment anchor to the ground while the kitty at the anterior segment release their hole off the ground. The circular muscle at the anterior segment contracts and the longitudinal muscle relax. The earthworm becomes longer and thinner. The anterior segment extends forward. The kitty at the anterior segment anchor to the ground while the kitty at the posterior segment release their hole off the ground. The posterior segment which is shorted is pulled to the front. Locomotion of the grasshopper The antagonistic muscles of a grasshopper that is the flexor and extensor are attached to the inner surface of the exoskeleton. The flexor bends a joint while the extensor straightens it. At rest, the flexor on the hind leg contracts, pulling the leg towards the body. In this position, the hind leg is folded into a Z shape and the grasshopper is ready to jump or leap. When the extensor contracts, the hind leg is straightened backwards. Subsequently, the catapult-like ejection of the hind legs projects the grasshopper forward and up into the air. Thank you. Bye-bye. This video, we are going to learn chapter 3.1 and chapter 3.2. from the external environment to carry out living processes. Cells must allow some substances to move into and out of the cells to maintain the living processes. So, how does the movement of substances is regulated? The answer is, it is regulated by the plasma membrane. The figure in the video shows the structure of the plasma membrane. Plasma membrane will separate the living cells such as glycolipid, channel protein, glycoprotein, carrier protein, and cholesterol from its environment. Lipid bilayer is made up of phospholipid molecule. It consists of a polar head which is hydrophilic, that means attracted to water, and a non-polar tail which is hydrophobic, which means repel water. Now we are going to the permeability of a plasma membrane. There are three types of permeability which is permeable, impermeable, and selectively permeable membrane. Membrane is said to be permeable when it allows a substance to pass through it freely. A membrane is impermeable if a substance is unable to move across it. While a selectively permeable membrane means the membrane only allows a few substances to move across it. Talk about the characteristics of movement of substances across a plasma membrane. There are two types of substances that can move across a plasma membrane, which is lipid soluble substances and lipid insoluble substances. Lipid soluble substances means non polar molecules, which are fatty acid, glycerol, fat soluble vitamins such as A, D, E, K, and steroid compounds. For lipid insoluble substances, there are two types of them such as small molecule and ion and large molecule. The examples for small molecule and ion is polar molecules such as water, non-polar molecules such as oxygen, carbon dioxide, and ion such as potassium, sodium, and magnesium. While for large molecule, we have examples such as glucose and amino acid. From the previous part, we can know that the substances can move across a plasma membrane. Now, the question is, how does the substances move across a plasma membrane? Substances can move across it through two transportations such as passive transport and active transport. Passive transport is the transportation that does not involve the use of energy. There are three types of transportation. The first one is simple diffusion. Simple diffusion is the movement of the substances from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. Those substances will diffuse through the phospholipid bilayer down the concentration gradient until an equilibrium situation is achieved. Next, transportation is the osmosis process. Osmosis process is the process that only involves water molecules from an area of high water potential to an area of low water potential. When passing through the semi-permeable membrane, only water molecules will pass through the membrane and the number of solutes remains the same. Last but not least, we are going to the facilitated diffusion. 
Facilitator diffusion involves the channel protein and carrier proteins. It does not require energy and only helps to transport the large molecules and ions that are unable to pass through the phospholipid bilayer. Once the substance achieves the channel proteins, it will act as a channel to transport or let the substance go through from outside the plasma membrane into the inside of the plasma membrane. So what will happen when a substance arrives at the carrier proteins? The substance will have a specific site on the carrier protein so that it can bind on it to enter the plasma membrane. Now we can see the figure above that shows the facilitated diffusion on the carrier proteins. When the glucose concentration outside the cell is higher than in the cytoplasm, the glucose molecules will bind with the specific site of the glucose carrier protein. After that, the glucose carrier protein will change shape to transport the glucose molecules into the cell. After it has transported all the glucose molecules into the cell, it will return to its original shape and be ready to transport other molecules. Active transport is a transportation that requires adenosine triphosphate molecules, short form as ATP, which is released during the cellular respiration. There are two types of active transport, which is sodium-potassium pump and proton pump. Sodium potassium pumps is the carrier proteins that transport sodium ions to extracellular and potassium ions into the cell. When the sodium ions approach the carrier proteins, it will bind to the carrier protein. After that, the ATP molecules will decompose into ADP and P, which is bounded to the carrier protein. P, which is the phosphate bond, will provide energy so that to change the shape of the carrier protein. Sodium ion will then be transported out of the cell. When potassium ions from outside the cell approach the carrier protein and is binded with it, the phosphate group will release the carrier protein. Leaving of the phosphate group will cause the carrier protein to return to its original shape. This causes the potassium ion to be transported into the cell. You know that the proton pump controls the acidity of our stomach. When the hydrogen ions approach the carrier protein, the ATP energy will cause the hydrogen ion to be transported out of the cell. This will cause an accumulation of the hydrogen ion and acid production in the stomach cavity. So, after everything we have learned, transportation divides into two such as passive transport and active transport. Passive transport is a transportation that does not require energy while an active transport requires. Both of them helps to transport a substance across a selectively permeable membrane. That's all the explanation from me for chapter 3.1 and 3.2. Thank you and see you next time. Bye.